How's it going? So in this video, we're going to talk about serotonin syndrome, also known as serotonin toxicity. And first, I'll start with a brief summary of what it is, and I expect this brief summary to be overwhelming and tough to internalize. So the plan is for us to go through everything slower so that by the end of the video, you have a good grasp of what's going on. So serotonin syndrome is a potentially life-threatening drug-induced condition caused by too much serotonin in the synapses of the brain. Patients present with a triad of neuromuscular, autonomic, and mental status symptoms. And what we're going to do in this video is go through the mechanisms, the symptoms, and an approach to thinking about the drugs that cause it so that by the end you can actually understand what that means. So let's start with the mechanisms that occur that lead to serotonin toxicity. So serotonin toxicity occurs after ingestion of drugs that substantially increase brain serotonin levels. So the toxicity is directly related to there being too much serotonin in the synapses of the brain. Now, some experts have put forth the spectrum concept of serotonin toxicity. So what this concept is saying is that serotonin toxicity isn't an idiosyncratic response in the body. It's not just a random collection of symptoms, but rather it's an expected response given that we've overloaded the receptors with serotonin and that we expect worsening symptoms the more that serotonin is hitting the receptors. So we know that serotonin raising drugs have characteristic side effects. For example, SSRIs have GI upset, sexual side effects, tremulousness, and as we increase the dose, these side effects become more and more severe. And if you keep raising and raising the levels of serotonin, then you go along the spectrum and eventually you're gonna hit a toxic level. So the gist of the spectrum concept is that the side effects become worse and worse with increasing doses until they eventually reach a severity that justifies being called toxic. So serotonin toxicity most often occurs when we're taking two or more serotonin elevating drugs together, especially when these drugs are increasing serotonin through different mechanisms. So what do I mean by that? We know what matters is the amount of serotonin in the synapses of the brain. So let's take a look at the synapse. So there are three major mechanisms by which serotonin increases in the synapse. And those three are inhibition of the MAO enzyme, serotonin reuptake inhibition, and serotonin releasers. So MAOIs increase the serotonin in the synapse by slowing the breakdown of serotonin. The SRIs, or serotonin reuptake inhibitors, prevent the transport of serotonin from the synapse back into the presynaptic terminal where they would have been degraded. And then serotonin releasers cause more serotonin to be released from the presynaptic terminal into the synapse. And I'll discuss later on which drugs fit into which categories. But for now, I just want you to grasp that serotonin toxicity occurs when we substantially increase synaptic serotonin levels, and that it's most likely to occur when we take two or more drugs that have different mechanisms of raising serotonin in the synapse. So let's quickly talk about the receptors involved here. So as I mentioned, we know that toxicity occurs when there's a ton of serotonin in the synapse. So if this occurs, all the serotonin receptors are going to be overloaded. But it's believed that stimulation of the 5-HT2A receptors are the receptors that are involved in the fatal effects. So 5-HT2A agonism has a direct effect on the mechanism that controls body temperature. And it's believed that the elevated temperature is the main change that mediates the severe life-threatening effects of serotonin toxicity. But I should mention here that it used to be believed that it was the 5-HT1A receptor that was the main one involved. And there are still some experts who believe it's the 1A receptor that's the main one. But it's been established that drugs that block the 5-HT2A postsynaptic receptors prevent deaths from hyperthermia in animals and likely humans. So it shouldn't be that surprising that one of the main treatments used for severe serotonin toxicity is ciproheptadine. And it's a potent 5-HT2A antagonist but it does have some 5-HT1A blockade to a lesser degree. All right, now let's talk a little bit about the symptoms of serotonin toxicity. So I feel like before when I thought of it as serotonin syndrome, I guess I viewed the list as sort of this almost random set of symptoms that were nearly impossible for me to internalize. But when we think of it as just a toxic amount of serotonin and the fact that there's a spectrum of these symptoms, I think we can get a better grasp of what the symptoms are. So as I mentioned before, Serotonin toxicity is characterized by a triad of features. Neuromuscular symptoms, 
autonomic symptoms, and altered mental status symptoms. And for some reason, I always get a little overwhelmed or confused when I hear those three symptoms together. So let's go through it a little bit slower and make it as simple as possible. So neuromuscular symptoms are just symptoms that include all the muscles in the body and the nerves that innervate them. Autonomic symptoms just refers to the autonomic nervous system, which we know controls the involuntary body functions. Things like heart rate, blood pressure, sweating, temperature. And then mental status symptoms refers to changes in cognition, emotion, and behavior. So what we're going to see is these three categories go into overdrive. We're going to see overactive muscle activity, typically related to the upper motor neurons. We're going to see an overactive nervous system, and we're going to see a hyperactive mental state. So let's just take a look at the list of symptoms that we see with serotonin toxicity. So mild symptoms are nervousness, insomnia, nausea, diarrhea, tremor, big pupils. Moderate, we see hyperreflexia, sweating, agitation, inducible clonus, and side-to-side eye movements. And then with severe, we see hyperthermia, confusion, sustained clonus, progressing to rigidity, rhabdo, and possibly even death. So that's why I like the spectrum formulation, because now it doesn't feel like just a random cluster of symptoms. So looking at the triad of symptoms, we see mental status progress from nervousness to agitation to confusion. Looking at the neuromuscular symptoms, we see hyperreflexia, progress to inducible clonus, progress to spontaneous clonus. So what we really see are these are all the same kind of symptoms that are just increasing in intensity. And I'll talk more in a second about the diagnostic criteria, but I think it's worth mentioning that some experts feel like the most relevant and objective criteria of severe serotonin toxicity is body temperature. So excessively elevated temperature, or hyperthermia, is the main change that mediates the severe, life-threatening effects of serotonin toxicity. But before we keep moving on, I think we should talk about the individual symptoms. I would expect most providers don't really have a good grasp on what clonus is. So clonus is a neurological sign that's an involuntary, rhythmic, repetitive muscle contraction or spasm. It assesses for upper motor neuron dysfunction, and it's a result of hyperexcitability of the muscle stretch reflex. So with toxicity, what we're seeing is an increasing level of hyperexcitability of this reflex. So it progresses from hyperreflexia to inducible clonus to spontaneous clonus. So spontaneous clonus is more severe compared to inducible clonus. And that's because spontaneous clonus refers to the rhythmic muscle contractions occurring without any sort of stimulation, whereas inducible clonus is when you provoke it. So, for example, ankle clonus is contractions of the calf muscle in response to a quick dorsiflexion of the foot at the ankle joint. So what does that mean and how do we test for it? So we take the foot and gently flex it at the ankle to the shin, and this stretches the calf muscle. Then you apply quick sustained pressure to maintain that stretch. If the patient has ankle clonus, the calf muscle will rhythmically contract and relax. And these rhythmic muscle contractions are the result of the hyperexcitability of the muscle stretch reflex. And while we're talking about clonus, ocular clonus is the exact same concept, except applied with the muscles of the eyes. So it's rhythmic, involuntary, repetitive oscillations of the eyes related to the upper motor neuron dysfunction. And it's worth noting that the speed that the eyes deviate is going to be the same both ways. This would be compared to, say, nystagmus, which is quick one way, and then slow to return back. All right, so moving on, there is no specific test for serotonin toxicity. So as a clinician, what you're really looking for is the history, the progression of the symptoms over time, and the drugs that the patient ingested. So, of course, serotonin toxicity is a drug-induced condition, so an accurate drug history is absolutely essential. There have been several criteria that have been proposed for serotonin toxicity, The two that you see the most are the Hunter Serotonin Toxicity Criteria or Sternbach's Criteria. So realistically, Hunter's Criteria is better. It's got a better sensitivity, 84 versus 75%, and better specificity, 97 versus 96%. But I think it's worth reviewing both. So looking at the Sternbach Criteria, it's just recent addition or increase in a known serotonergic agent. B is just absence of other possible etiologies like infections, metabolic substance abuse, or withdrawal. And then C is no recent addition or increase of a neuroleptic agent. And then the rest of A is at least three of the following symptoms. Mental status changes, agitation, myoclonus, hyperreflexia, diaphoresis, shivering, tremor, diarrhea, incoordination, and fever. And then next, Hunter's criteria is a decision tree for serotonin toxicity. It can look a little bit confusing, but it's really not. Basically, all it's saying is that if the clinical picture has any of these five descriptors, then you can make diagnosis of serotonin toxicity. 
So going through the decision tree, if any of the questions are yes, then you make the diagnosis. So going down the decision tree, is there spontaneous clonus? Let's just say no. Is there inducible clonus with agitation or diaphoresis? No. Is there ocular clonus with agitation or diaphoresis? No. Is there tremor and hyperreflexia? No. Is there hypertonia and a temperature over 38 degrees Celsius and ocular or inducible clonus? So if it doesn't match any of those five pictures, then you don't have the diagnosis of serotonin toxicity. So it's not as complicated as it looks. And as I was mentioning before, there's degrees of severity of clonus. So it makes sense if you have the less severe inducible clonus or ocular clonus that you're going to need additional symptoms to make the diagnosis. Hello, I am the creator of Psychopharm. I'm here today to announce the Psychopharm Antidepressant Psychopharmacology course. I've put what can only be described as a stupid amount of time into making this course. I learned a new software so that the graphics are nice and clean. Um, I've put all my free time into making these videos. I'm covering a lot in this course. It's going to go over kind of the basics of treating depression. It's going to go over the SSRIs, the SNRIs, the MAOIs, the TCAs, and some of the atypical antidepressants. I really appreciate all the support. If you can share this with people who you think would be interested in this course, I would really appreciate it. If this goes okay, then I can justify continuing to spend so much time on making this stuff, and I hope to eventually move to an antipsychotic course, a mood stabilizer course. Um, I have a lot of ideas, I just need to justify using all this time on these projects. Thank you for watching, thank you for considering, um, have a good day.